Hello, and welcome to this world debut of Forward to the Moon, a full dome film produced by Fisk Planetarium at the University of Colorado Boulder. My name is John Keller. I'm the director here at Fisk, and we're pleased to present this seven minute short trailer of what's soon to be a feature length film that, we'll re that we will be releasing in August of 2021. I'm um, sorry, in fall of 20, 2021. Um, but we wanted to give the planetarium community and world a brief preview of this film that is soon to be coming out, um, that's coming out today uh, at, with this debut. Um, Fisk Planetarium is a 206 seat, 65 foot dome theater on the University of Colorado Boulder campus. We also have a production studio that has produced a series of short films and feature length films uh, for various foundations like NASA, the National Science Foundation and other organizations and agencies. Uh, the film that we're going to be screening today is called Forward to the Moon. It's a collaboration with NASA, uh, SURVEY, the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute at NASA Ames Research Center, and with NESS, which is the, uh, with NESS, the Network for Exploration and Space Science here at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, this film is switching the Artemis mission, which is going to take the first, the first woman and next man to the moon in 2024, um, and we're, uh, we're going to be sharing it with you uh, so that you can share it with your audiences, either pre-COVID or post-COVID, uh, not pre-COVID, COVID or post-COVID. Um, so uh, last piece I wanted to introduce is that this uh, film has, is just one of a series of productions we put together through our NASA Explorations series, um, which you will be able to download and learn about uh, over the course of the webinar. Finally, we'd like to thank the NASA Museum Alliance for helping to promote this event and getting the word out to planetarium directors to join us for today's presentation and webinar. Um, and the schedule of today's event will be that we'll be doing uh, uh, panel discussions from Jack Burns, the director of NESS, Kerry Byron from Mythbusters and Crash Test World, who is the narrator for our film. We'll then be screening the, the short film uh, for this group. Uh, and then finishing up with talks by Greg Schmidt, the director of SURVEY, and Jim Green, the NASA chief scientist. There will also be time for questions for the last 10 to 15 minutes, um, and we'll be recording this video so that we can um, share it with the public um, after this event has occurred. Um, so with that, um, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Jack Burns, the director of NASA at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, we apologize for a little technical glitch in the very first uh, 30 seconds of his recording, so you will be picking up midstream, but you only missed about 30 seconds. And Jack Jack fills the room with much more information than just those 30 seconds. So we will turn it over to Jack Burns. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the presentation. They are going to new places and doing new kinds of sciences on the moon that we couldn't even conceive of uh, during the Apollo era. Uh, we're going to the, the poles of the moon, particularly the south pole of the moon, where uh, in the last few years has been a discovery of water ice, which is very valuable. Uh, and then we're going to go to the far side of the moon. Uh, and the far side contains the oldest, largest, deepest impact basin uh, in the inner solar system. And it's also the only place in the inner solar system that is totally radio quiet at radio frequencies. So these are exciting new places we haven't been to before. One example of the new science that's described in the film is radio astronomy at low frequencies from the lunar far side. Both in orbit and also on the surface, we're going to be forging new frontiers and opening up new epochs to the universe that we haven't seen before. Um, time periods called the Dark Ages and the Cosmic Dawn, both before and just during the time that um, the first stars formed. Uh, this is the only way that we can explore these early times in the universe and really learn more about how stars and galaxies formed as a whole. So John, I think that's a, that's a bit of a preview of what's coming up. I think I will stop there and pass it back. Great. Thanks so much, Jack, and thanks for your leadership and guidance in helping this production come to fruition. Um, next, I'd like to spotlight um, the, the people behind the production. Uh, these are the individuals who have done all of the graphics and visuals and sound and 
uh, that you will be hearing and seeing in the next 10 minutes. Um, we're pulling them up right now. Uh, so I'd like to introduce, uh, just for a quick wave, uh, Thor Metzinger is our production uh, manager here at Fisk Planetarium, who's produced all of the films we've produced for Full Dome since 2013. Uh, Brian Bishop and Tom Ludlow are both from uh, are both from ten are both from ten studio in the Boulder Denver area, um, and they have provided us all of the computer graphics that you'll be seeing. And then we also have uh, Tom Muncy. He is our sound engineer, and he has helped with the recording of the narration track, which we'll be featuring next. Um, and lastly, I'd like to be, put a huge shout out to to England to Jenny Shipway. Um, and I think we want to spotlight there, Jenny. Jenny is the scriptwriter who actually put together the script that you'll be hearing today. And so there, here they come. We've got Jenny, our scriptwriter, Tom and Brian from Ten Studio, and Thor Metzinger uh, from our production studio here at this Planetarium. So thank you, all of you guys, for the work that you've done to make this production. Uh, next, I'm very, very thrilled to introduce uh, Carrie Byron, who is the narrator for this film, uh, both the short film as well as the, the feature-length film that we'll be producing in, in fall of next year. Uh, Carrie, you will all know from Mythbusters and now from her new production, Crash Test World, which I'm very, very, uh, very excited about. She's been doing amazing work helping us study our planet and how we can use our planet to do good as opposed to destruction. Uh, we wanted uh, Carrie just to provide a brief introduction about her involvement in the film and, and the importance of science communication. I couldn't be more happy to be a part of this. I've always been very fascinated by space and space exploration. And I think it's one of those beautiful fields that really inspires kids to get into STEM, or I like to call it STEAM. I had the art in there. Um, I really do believe that the arts help with the dreaming of science. Um, I, I think that it is an incredible field that drives us to be curious. And that's what I've always been fascinated by is the curiosity of man. And this project was, I, sit, I screamed yes the minute it came into my inbox because being a part of this film was such a beautiful opportunity to highlight that curiosity. Thank you guys. Awesome, thank you so much, Carrie. It's been great working with you and we have more tracks to, to cut. <laughs> yeah. um, so we are actually now at the point where we're ready to screen, uh, to screen the video. Um, we're going to be sharing with you via Zoom the Full Dome Master. We figured most all of you are planetarium files, and so you're used to looking at circles instead of squares. Um, and so we'll be producing or providing you the screening uh, here on Zoom. But right at the very end of the show of the, of the short film, we will be sharing a link that will have an FTP site and a, and a downloadable, uh, downloadable uh, document with, with links to all of our Full Dome Masters, as well as to a virtual reality YouTube app, where you can watch this on YouTube in a planetarium environment, the Fisk planetar planetarium environment. Um, the one thing I would, will note is that, um, again, this is just, a, this is just a, a teaser, just a short. So this is just six or seven minutes of a 25 minute film to come. And so we have, we've taken sections of the film uh, pretty much verbatim for what the script currently is and giving you different uh, kind of a snapshot of the types of content that are covered. Um, but this is just a third. Um, is that a third? A fourth? I can do math, Jack. Yes, yeah, so this is a fourth to a third of the full dome film that we'll be seeing, releasing next, next fall. And so I think with that, we are ready to have Thor take over and to screen share our world premiere exclusive of Forward to the Moon. Within a single lifetime, we've progressed from the first space rocket launch to using space technologies in our everyday lives. Both governments and private companies have taken up the challenge, launching near-Earth satellites for communication, imaging, and navigation. Low Earth orbit has become another part of the world economy. The International Space Station has been continually inhabited for over 20 years, hosting teams of astronauts 
who carry out research and trial new robotic technologies. Now we are ready to start a new chapter in the history of human endeavor, to take our first steps towards a permanent off-world presence. Forward to the moon. The moon, our closest neighbor in space, and the perfect training ground for more distant travel. The moon is also an interesting destination in its own right, with ancient geology giving clues to our own planet's history. NASA has sent astronauts here before, but this time it's different. An international effort supported by multiple partnerships with governments and private enterprise, all with a shared vision for the future in space. The NASA program that landed humans on the moon last century was named after the Greek sun god Apollo. NASA's 21st century program to take humans forward to the moon is called Artemis, after the Greek moon goddess, the twin of Apollo. And the Artemis spacecraft is called Orion. Whoever rides Orion to the moon will have a formidable journey ahead. The moon is 384,000 kilometers or 240,000 miles from Earth. It will take the Artemis astronauts about five days to reach it. Every moment trusting their lives to the engineers who designed and built Orion's protective systems. Artemis is not an end in itself, but just the first step towards a sustainable future in space. For this reason, NASA is leading development of an orbiting spaceport called the Gateway. The Gateway provides a rendezvous point for landers, cargo, and supplies needed to support landed operations on the lunar surface. And extra living space for visiting astronauts. Constructed by robotic missions in the years leading up to the astronauts' arrival, it will be used by both crewed and robotic spacecraft. At the same time as the Gateway is being prepared, private companies will be landing a series of NASA science instruments and technologies on the moon. Missions include tests of a LiDAR precision navigation system, technology that could help future craft land safely at a moon base. These new commercial landing systems will also deliver any advanced equipment and supplies that the Artemis astronauts require. Robots will be central to one of the most exciting opportunities the moon offers. A radio telescope able to look back to the very beginnings of our universe. Out there we know our faint radio signals from a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background. In addition, hydrogen from the dark ages, before the first stars formed, emit at low radio frequencies. But these are swamped by the constant radio chatter coming from our own planet, as well as by the ionosphere on the Earth's surface. Earth's radio signals spread out through space, but are blocked by the moon's rocky body, creating a radio shadow. As the moon always keeps this same face turned away from Earth, this creates the only place in the solar system that is consistently shielded from our planet's radio pollution. Initial tests will be carried out on the near side and using a small orbiting telescope named DAPR, which will pass through the moon's radio shadow. Here, in the silence, what secrets might we hear whispered from the universe? A large surface telescope called 
far side will only be possible when the gateway enables direct human contact with the far side of the moon. Only then can astronauts telerobotically deploy and maintain such a facility. With everything in place, it will be time to start a new chapter in our history for the Artemis III mission to take humans forward to the moon's surface. We are the Artemis generation. I will unmute myself. There is the trailer, um, the five minute short version. Um, again, this will be available uh, via our, the link that we have just posted in the chat box um, at our FISC Planetarium FTP site. We'll also be following up with your email addresses and sending you an email with the same link and other information about the film. It is again free for screening for eternity. So feel free to use it however you would like to use it in your theaters. Uh, we do recognize during this time of COVID that this is a very difficult time for many of us and uh, similar to, to our theater, which is closed right now. Many of you are currently closed. Um, one of the links on the website that you'll be getting will actually have an, a, a VR version of this film, which is being streamed via, via YouTube. And so you can, you can uh, publicize this and, and send this to your audiences um, and your membership if they would like to view it online as a virtual event um, rather than an in-person event. And then again, God willing, see very soon we will be able to come together in, in person again in our theaters. Um, and definitely by the time that the feature length film is released this coming fall, fall of 2021. Um, with that, I'd like to turn over to the last part of our program. We have two more special uh, presentations. Uh, by both Greg Schmidt from the NASA Survey Center, as well as from Jim Green from NASA headquarters. Um, Greg Schmidt is the director of the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, um, who has been the major supporter of this grant um, that helped us put together this production. Greg, thanks for your time. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, I wanna say what a privilege it is to, uh, to fund this and, uh, and NASA in general. Um, I also want to say, um, Carrie, that it's quite a privilege to share the virtual stage with you. I'm a longtime huge Mythbusters fan, and I, I think there's a relationship here because um, science, like in Mythbusters, is fun. And, uh, and I think this portrays um, science in a, uh, in a fun um, kind of way. Um, although, albeit with uh, far fewer explosions than uh, Myth Mythbusters. So uh, our institute started as the NASA Lunar Science Institute. And we, um, this was back in 2008, and we witnessed the rebirth of lunar science. At the time, there were just a, a handful of uh, hardy folks who had, uh, who had kept the fires burning, the lunar fires burning, if you will, since the Apollo uh, era, and, uh, and we were one of NASA's efforts to um, really give a, a global rebirth to, uh, to lunar science. We did this um, under the guidance of Jim Green, who you're going to be hearing from um, next. And, uh, and basically what our institute is all about is bridging science and exploration. And there's so many different ways um, that we do it. You heard from uh, Jack and also from um, Carrie in her narration of about the uh, radio astronomy and uh, um, astrophysics that we will be able to do and we're so pleased to be able to support um, at Survey. There's so many other things uh, as well. Um, for instance, the moon is an airless body um, or nearly so. And so uh, as such, it's preserved evidence from the early solar system, uh, which has long ago been erased on Earth. And that can give us um, important clues 
as to what happened. Um, and, uh, and so it gives credence to some brand new theories, um, for instance, about the for formation of the uh, solar system. And, uh, and that it looks very, very different from the solar system that I learned about uh, back when I was in college. So uh, we also study things like uh, resources. It was mentioned earlier about the discovery of water ice on the moon. And that's gonna be a really important resource when we go back to the moon or go forward to the moon, I should say, to stay. And we have teams studying that uh, as well. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to mention was a talk that I heard probably about 10 or so years ago by a person I really admire. Chris McKay is, is his name, one of the world's foremost Mars scientists and lunar scientists. And uh, he spent a lot of time early in his career in Antarctica. And, uh, and he said, and this really stuck with me, he said that we're not going to even know the questions to ask until we go there and we live there. And I really believe that's the case, that when we, um, when we form these permanent uh, bases on the moon, we're going to have, um, have insights unveiled to us that we aren't even dreaming of right now. And what an exciting thing that is. And I'd just like to close by saying that, um, that outreach in, in the way we're doing it here through this planetarium show and the many other ways that we uh, support, such as the uh, International Observe the Moonlight Night just a couple of weeks ago, um, is so important to, uh, we basically work for the American public and the international public uh, as well. And, uh, and so we at Surrey are so, so, so pleased to, to support that and, uh, and engage everyone in this great exploration that we uh, have planned. So John, thank you and back to you. Thank you so much, Ray. Uh, and then our last presentation before we do a question and answer session for the last 15 minutes today is NASA Chief Scientist Jim Green, uh, who many, some of you have met before. I've had the pleasure of working with Jim for the last, just the last year myself, and we're great to have you, have you aboard, Jim. So thanks for, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks so very much. Uh, it's really exciting uh, what's going to be happening in the next several years, and we really need to get ready for it. You know, I was in high school when the Apollo missions uh, started landing on the moon, and it was absolutely riveting. And, and, and yet it was, you know, we were huddled around a black and white TV. I had to adjust the antennas, you know. It's uh, it was really crazy, but we're going to see it now in high definition and beautiful colors. And I was so excited about how the astronauts moved so mysteriously and the dust that they would kick up and the experiments that they would deploy. And I wanted to learn much more about it. What's going to happen next, uh, that pales in comparison. You know, we're going to go uh, by 2024, landing the first woman and the next man on the South Pole of the Moon. And it's not anywhere near the Apollo sites, which were mostly in the equator on the near side of the Moon. On that South Pole, we know now that it is a whole series of mysterious scientific questions that we want to answer. We believe a significant amount of the history of the early solar system and its evolution is hidden in many of these craters in that South Pole because from orbit we're sensing water. But now we also realize that there's far more than water that's in these craters. There's all kinds of other things that we call volatiles we now believe perhaps the early Earth's atmosphere might be able to be found trapped in these permanently shadowed craters, which by the way, are the coldest surface structures in the solar system. Even the mountains of Pluto aren't as cold as what's in these permanently shadowed craters. So this is really a spectacular opportunity for us to go in and take a detailed look. 
It's also not like the previous Apollo program because we're going to go with a set of international uh, partners and commercial partners. We've been working this now for many years. And in fact, we've created what we call the Artemis Accords. And these are international guidelines on how all our partners will work with us together. And just last week, we had seven nations signing those international accords. Australia, Canada, uh, Italy, Japan, uh, UAE, Luxembourg, and the United Kingdom. And we think that's just the start. Many other nations plan to sign them. So what's in the accords? Well, the accords talk about the peaceful purposes of exploring the moon and space. It talks about transparency. We tell everyone what we're doing, where we're going, what we hope to find. We talk about interoperability. We build systems that can connect. And this actually enables us to help if there's an emergency on the moon, having one nation help another nation. There's also a, a, a major thrust in releasing the scientific data that we will uh, uncover. So there's many of these things that are occurring uh, that all these nations have agreed to. Now what's happening in the next several years leading up to 2024 is indeed a series of beautiful missions with the Orion capsule launched by the Space Launch System, uh, the SLS we call it, and getting us to the moon, building a gateway, which is a small space station that orbits the moon and acts as a communication relay, but also as a hub for us to be able to deploy instruments down to the surface, along with humans transporting back and forth. I mean, we're going to enter an era of just tremendously exciting activity. And the object, of course, is getting to the moon, getting to areas on the moon and the South Pole that we've never been before. We're finding a lot of metals and platinum group metals, palladium, polonium, iridium, things that are important in building things that, that we use today, electronics. You know, perhaps there's a way we can mine those. You know, the future of going to the moon is really going to boil down to a number of major activities. While we continue to explore, we perhaps can create fuel depots based on the oxygen in the water that's trapped in these permanently shadowed regions. Other types of manufacturing might also be on the horizons. So what we're seeing is the start of humanity's trek out into the solar system. You know, we are the first species on this planet that has the ability to leave it and explore the solar system. In a way, the solar system is humanities to explore. And all the countries that are aligning themselves with NASA will be our partners as we venture out. And we want you to come along on the journey. And it's these types of planetarium films that get that concept out of what we're trying to do in this new era of beyond low Earth orbit space exploration that I'm really excited about. And I want to be able to let everyone know the activities that we're doing and to be able to go to their local planetarium and enjoy the excitement with us. So come along. John, let me turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Jim. Always John, fun. let me let me just say to uh, Jim, I think he needs to show more excitement in his presentations from now on. Uh, it's really, you know, he needs to get that energy level up. So, well, it's that exciting, Jack, and you know it. I mean, you know that it is, man. It is when you think it about is. standing on the South Pole and the long shadows. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna look even eerier than than what we saw. You know, in our young days, looking at the Apollo astronauts walking around and the kind of things that we're going to start doing, we're going to, you know, we're going to have uh, vehicles on the surface that will take us to various locations. We're going to be deploying instruments. We're going into these permanently shadowed craters. We're going to be going back and forth to the gateway. 
The staying on the moon, three days for Apollo 17, that was maximum. We're talking about weeks and perhaps months of humans walking around on the surface, living and working on a planetary surface. Wow, how can you not get excited about that, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can say that again. So uh, before we turn it over to a question and answer for our, five, for our four panelists, um, I just wanted to share a couple of final details. Uh, Jim mentioned the, the public-private public -private partnerships. Um, we want to acknowledge that Lockheed Martin has helped support this film, both with in-kind supports as well as some of their contributions. And we've actually worked with a number of the partners involved in the Artemis mission in terms of getting spacecraft models and getting various uh, uh, video assets for use uh, in this production, which we'll be talking about the entire overarching Artemis mission. Um, the second thing I wanted to put a plug in for, just so we, you get this before the end of the talk, is that we also want to feature students, kids, children, and their enthusiasm for going to the moon. And so we'll be posting a link, a second link, in today's uh, chat box, which is a Cinebody link, which you can share with your audiences and your membership to have students of any age um, join us for basically a 30-second interview, a 30-second snapshot of what excites them about going back to going forward to the moon. And so we'll be using uh, clips from those from those videos uh, in the in the film. We probably won't be able to feature thousands, but a, you know, a select five to 10 students will hopefully be able to be featured in this in this fold on film. So we really encourage you to uh, promote this to your audiences um, as a way to get them involved in the filmmaking that we're doing. Um, I think at that point, uh, we're going to turn it over. We have just over 10 minutes. Um, for any questions that you have for our panelists. And I'd encourage you to either raise your hand or to chat your question in the chat box. Um, and we actually already have a first question as you're starting to get ready to think about your questions. Um, we have a question from, from Catamaran, Sailor, um, about whether there's any, uh, any discussion of the possible H3 gold rush. Mm. Uh, should fusion succeed? Just mentioning because China seems to be pursuing that possibility vis-a-vis -vis lunar installations. So would anybody like to take a question about H3 on the moon? Sorry, John, that's actually helium free. Oh, yeah, um, sorry. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it is um, a material that some have, um, have speculated can be used uh, as an important ingredient for uh, nuclear fusion. Um, the, um, indeed, the moon does appear to have a good bit of uh, helium three probably implanted from the solar wind, uh, but I think we're we're pretty far away from a situation where we could make use of it. Uh, we don't have a working fusion reactor uh, on the uh, surface of the uh, of the Earth on the ground right now. That's been worked on for 60, 70 years, uh, and we're still not there yet. So I think we're going to have to first perfect how to do controlled nuclear fusion. Um, in the laboratory in a demonstrative power model. And then at that point, um, the question might arise, uh, could helium-3 be a source of fuel for those kind of reactors? But I do think that's likely decades away in the future. Thanks, Jack. Um, that was actually Heather Preston who asked the question and she had a follow-up question about the accords that you mentioned, Jim. Uh, specifically, I was curious about will China be part of the Artemis Accords? So the uh, Artemis Accords are a multilateral agreement, which uh, even in law, we can work within a multilateral framework. Uh, China at the moment hasn't expressed any interest in um, uh, signing the accords, although they are certainly aware of them. Uh, they've been many, to many of our international meetings. Uh, in fact, the signing ceremony that happened uh, last week, bringing these first seven nations on, was at an international conference, uh, which included virtually every space agency. And, and therefore, uh, everyone is well aware of the accords. So uh, these are uh, important tenets of... Um, uh, of, of, of uh, agreements between uh, how we will work together and uh, they are available for uh, each nation to read, consider, and then uh, hopefully join us into the future. Right now they have not shown any interest. 
Great. Um, the next question, I think, is a question for me. Um, do we have an outline of the other topics in the show that aren't in the short? And that is a great suggestion. We will include that in the email that we'll be sending out uh, following this, this uh, webinar. Um, the, the film does spend a significant amount of time talking about the space launch system, about the challenges of, of, that, tri of that trip from the Earth to the moon in terms of uh, radiation, the radiation environment and the micrometeorite environment. Um, it also talks about, really importantly, the telerobotic presence on the moon and the use of, of, of having humans in orbit on the gateway, being able to telecommunicate with robots on the surface without any latency, without any latency or latent time. And so uh, these are just some of the features that will be in the film. Jack, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think you hit, uh, you hit the nail on the head. One of the, when I was talking about taking Silicon Valley to the moon, part of the idea was that the next generation of explorers are going to be working hand in hand with robots. It won't just be Jack Schmidt, you know, with his shovel doing classical field geology, but it will be an astronaut with a team of rovers and robots who will be uh, going out with various different sensors and um, investigating in advance. And then the astronaut will be used for what they really need to be used for, and that is to help interpret some of these, what we expect will be some interesting and unexpected findings on the surface of the moon. So that, that interaction, um, I mean, we couldn't even think about doing that in the 1960s. The technology wasn't there. Today, uh, telerobotic operation, both from astronauts and habitats on the moon and in the gateway, uh, I think are gonna be the standard operating procedure. Excellent. Uh, we uh, have a shout out to acknowledge Paul's, Dr. Paul Spudis for his contribution to this, uh, to, to lunar exploration. Um, yeah. And Jack, as our director and uh, creative manager, just gave us a thumbs up. We will, we will look into, we will move forward on that. Um, the production is going to be 25 minutes in length. Um, so that's our goal. Uh, it may be 26 with credits, but um, currently we're shooting for about 25 minutes. It really depends upon the speed with which Carrie speaks um, in her narration. Um, and actually, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Carrie for a second uh, with a question for you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, I'm actually just curious of, to share more about Crash Test World with us and how the work you're trying to do there is related to the work that you saw in the narration track that you were reading today or uh, in preparation for today. Well, Crash Test World is all about innovations and big ideas, and we definitely hope to do a space episode as well because there's so many big questions about space. The thing I love the most about space research and the fact that we're going back to the moon is the discovery that might happen along the way. So many inventions and so many beautiful things have come about just unwittingly because we were trying to get to the moon in the first place. Um, Crash Test World travels all around the globe looking for people with curiosity and big ideas, which is exactly what you guys are doing. We're trying to inspire everybody into a little bit more hope and empathy and to find how we can all fit into this world together as a global citizenry which is exactly what y'all doing, <laughs> getting all the nations involved. There is nothing better than creativity and diversity to get our accomplishments achieved. Well said. Awesome, thank you, Carrie. Uh, Michelle Risi uh, from the SCOBY Science Center in Texas has a question. What would you all like to share with the future generation to get them excited for projects like this and to encourage them to want to do the interviews? Well, from my perspective, uh, there's all kinds of things to learn about the moon. Uh, you know, we are uh, beginning the process of, of uh, going back and looking at our data for, for many years and reanalyzing it in many different ways and talk about some of the exciting results that are coming out, in particular in the northern hemisphere and the south and southern hemisphere in these polar regions. So um, uh, the many things that NASA is doing also in terms of podcasts had come out that well, many, uh, many kids and, and uh, lifelong learners and people just really enjoy. Uh, I would encourage you to find and tune into uh, 
that keeps you up to speed on what's happening on a regular basis. Greg, anything you'd like to add to that? Well, um, I was just thinking of a story uh, at the 40th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing. Um, I and the, the then founding director of, of our institute were invited by Buzz Aldrin to go to, up to the USS Hornet and have lunch with him and, and, uh, and talk about his, uh, um, about his historic landing. And I decided I wanted to bring my daughter to this. And uh, she was, uh, she's now um, just about 22. She was about 10 um, at the time. And, uh, and it was, to me, that, that's something that has stuck with me um, all these years is the, the impression that she got um, from being there and, uh, and seeing this, um, this person who had actually walked on the moon. And I think connecting with that is, is an amazing experience for uh, young people, however we do it. And, and Greg, the, the, you should mention about the Hornet. Why, 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 why is the Hornet so special and where is it at? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, good point, Jim. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, just across the bay from uh, San Francisco in, uh, in Alameda. It's special because uh, it was the aircraft carrier that, uh, that recovered the uh, astronauts from Apollo 11. So, uh, and we actually, our institute, my institute has a partnership with, uh, with them now to, uh, um, to do all sorts of stuff in terms of uh, public outreach. Yeah, and what's in that mid deck on the Hornet is, um, you know, one of the isolation centers that the astronauts then were, were ushered into for quarantine purposes, because we didn't know if, if they would be bringing back some sort of extraterrestrial bug uh, that would harm our population. So, um, so that, that, there's a lot of history there that's really spectacular to see. Yeah. Um, one last thing I'd like to note for all of our planetarians out there, um, one of the things that is missing from the current CG film is uh, actual footage from Kennedy Space Flight Center and Johnson Space Flight Center as we prepare for the Artemis mission. Um, and I just wanted to let you all know that we're working closely with Radislav Siniak from Johnson Space Flight Center, who has purchased a, a, three, a 12, 12, 12 megabyte, uh, 12, a 12, K, 12 megabyte camera to do full dome imagery of uh, various pieces of the Artemis mission that will be made publicly available for all planetariums and all planetariums and all virtual reality spaces. And so this is a resource that you can use in the future, um, having access to those tools that Radislav will be uh, negotiating for the entire media um, and planetarium world. Um, we are unfortunately out of time because uh, it is 2.46. Uh, and um, we are gonna repost the links right now to both the, uh, the film to download the 4K, the 2K, the 1.5K or the 1K full dome masters or the VR version, or the or the full the full blown film um, on YouTube, and so that'll be uh, that's accessible. If you go to that link and sign up to indicate your interest, just click on the forward. You'll actually see all of our explorations videos and all of our productions. But go ahead and click as many as you want, including forward. Um, and I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Jim, Jack, Carrie, and Greg, for your time, um, and everyone for joining in on today's call. Sorry we didn't get to all of the questions, um, but. Uh, Thanks for joining and we'll do this again in just a year. Thank you, John. Thanks Thank so you. Thanks, John. Thanks everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you.